Hi, my name's Tim Forsyth, and I remix old video game music for the Commodore 64. And in this video, I'm going to be taking a look at a remix I made back in April 2023 for the game Scarabaeus. Scarabaeus was released in 1985 by a Hungarian team called Andromeda Software. You're wandering around this maze, in a tomb, it's really spooky. And one of the most memorable things about this game for me, apart from the fact I never finished it, was the music. The music has this haunting atmosphere and creates a real sense of tension as you're navigating this maze, solving puzzles, unsure what you're going to run into every time you turn a corner. So before I dive in and have a look at how I made this remix, let's have a little listen to some of the original Sid, then I'll play the remix in full, and then I'll be back to dive under the hood. Oh, I should say, warning, this video has flashing images.
Right, so before we dive in, have a look at um, the mix. Uh, I just want to talk briefly about how I get started making remixes. Uh, and it all starts with just getting familiar with the original song. Uh, I'd usually just listen to it on YouTube, to be honest, uh, and play along on the keyboard, just to kind of discover how to play the melodies, what chords are in the song, what key we're in, that kind of thing. Um, if uh, you if it gets tricky, sometimes it does. Um, you've got that um, playback speed option in YouTube. That's always quite handy. Uh, and if it gets really hard, or if I want to use elements of the original SID, uh, JSID player's got a great command line interface to export the um, three separate channels of three separate audio files, and you can load them into your door and mess around with them. Um, and normally it's quite straightforward. Uh, a lot of songs, you know, normally have like a bass line. Let me just bring up a keyboard so you can see what I'm doing. I'm actually playing this on a MIDI keyboard, um, but this this keyboard, you can actually play it on uh, the touch screen, but it just helps you visualize what I'm playing. Um, but yeah, most songs, well, quite a lot of songs, uh, have you know a, a bass line where the root note is the root note of the chord being played. And normally it's fairly straightforward to actually listen um, and uh, figure out what, what chords are being played. Or if you slow down the song, you can figure out, you know, normally, normally maybe you've got an arpeggio that's playing, uh, playing the notes of the chord. Often if the chord's a little bit more uh, advanced or a bit more extended, uh, you might get, might have to slow that down even further. Um, but with Scarabaeus, um, a little bit more challenging. The, I mean, part of the problem is probably because, you know, I'm not a very good keyboard player. Uh, you know, I don't play my keyboard every day. And my music knowledge is so-so, you know, uh, I know the, the absolute basics, but anything more advanced. Um, these days I generally tend to look up, but I look up after the fact. Normally when I'm trying to discover what the song's made up of, uh, I'm kind of looking for the same sort of patterns I'm seeing elsewhere. Um, I'm trying to figure out what the bass notes are doing in the context of the chords, what the chords are, norm are they major or minor, that kind of thing. Um, Scarabaeus is kind of unusual um, in the, you know, the opening arpeggio is, is playing this, right? And if we take what I said about the arpeggio playing the chords, well, I didn't really recognise what that chord was. Um, people who are familiar with music will probably be, probably be screaming at me going, that's a B major flat five, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, so I looked at the bass to see what the bass is doing to kind of get me some you know, starting point, what some grounding to figure out where we are, uh, what key we're in. So you've got the arpeggio doing this and the bass doing this. So we've got this E flat bass and we've got this unusual sort of B chord where this we turned out to be a B flat five. Um, so it was at this point I remember thinking, well, I don't know what I'm doing right now. Let's try and figure out what key we're in. So to do that, I just play every single note that's currently playing in the song at this point in time. So we've got the arpeggio doing this. We've got the bass notes doing this. So we've already got that uh, E flat. So there's a B flat here. So the, these notes are all notes in the key. Then we've got the melody that starts like this. So we've already got that E flat. So we've got our, uh, an F sharp there. So uh, it didn't take too much uh, effort to figure out if I walk down get that familiar sound there we are we're, we're, we're probably i think we're in f sharp right so that's kind of a good starting point as it turns out it was a complete waste of time um so we've got our starting chord which um i, I ended up picking b major because it sounded a bit more harmonious at the time and then the next chord because the melody goes so the arpeggio does this then does this and the, an interesting thing happens with the bass. There's this bass that's on E flat. If you notice, when the uh, arpeggio changes itself, the bass note finds its home. So we've got our next chord, which is an E flat sus2 chord. Um, and I just mentioned something about sus chords, and so in that they're, they're neither major nor minor, um, which is quite important to what happened next to me. Um, so a sus chord, yeah, a chord. A, a, a basic chord is this triad, these three notes, one, three, five, and that third, that's the note that determines whether it's major or minor. And sus chords step outside of this, and so they're neither major or minor. In fact, yeah, you've heard this uh, sus chord cliche before. Um, but if I play the uh, the melody and the sus chord, how's that? 
I came across this note, this G, and I thought, what's G doing there? Because I thought I was in F sharp, and F sharp does not have a G. Um, and what's happened, interestingly enough, is this sus chord, being neither major or minor, has hidden the fact that we've changed key. And if I play E flat major instead, it sounds right. So actually what's happened, we've changed key from the key of F sharp to the key that this E flat major chord's in, which is the key of E flat. So that, that will help me figure out the next chord in line. So the, ba the, um, the arpeggio moves from doing this to that. And knowing I was in E flat means it wasn't too difficult to figure out that we actually go down to this um, A flat major. And then the next part was quite straightforward to figure out because the arpeggio moves down along with the bass because the bass is just being sat here just doing this E flat thing. Um, the uh, arpeggio moves from this to C. So we have this nice uh, uh, C sus2 chord. Um, maybe one of the most famous sus2 chords ever, maybe. but we're not going to go there. Um, so yeah, we've got this uh, nice C sus2 chord here. Uh, and then to end, sort of wrap up this section of the song, the bass line helps us get to the next chord because the bass line goes up. And we end up back on um, A flat major. And that's essentially it for the, um, you know, the, the melody. Um, what happens after this point? is we go back to the start, we start playing, there's our, our B, there's our sus2 or major, there's an A flat major. And at this point, instead of the bass line going down to C, it just sticks around. And what the arpeggio is doing is it goes from doing this, and instead of going down here to our sus chord, it goes from here and just returns to this E flat major. So in, the, the difference is you get this really unusual end uh, to this section. And to the end of this loop of the melody, um, you get this uh, E flat major that kind of feels like it's unresolved. It needs to keep moving on. Um, one, I guess, interesting thing I did here was instead of playing E flat major, I turned it into a seventh which gives it just this richer sound. Um, and by inverting that as well, further up the keyboard, you get this really nice sort of rich chord that still has this kind of, sort of, sort of I don't know, this air of tension about it as well. Um, and that's one thing throughout this song and a lot of songs I do, I tend to try to do is, you know, if you're going to play a major chord, just try and spice it up a little bit. You know, just add in an extra sus note or something else, just kind of spice it up. Turn it into a seventh if you, if you can. You know, there's all these little tricks you can do just to kind of add a bit more character to your chords. And I've tried to do that throughout this piece. So earlier on I was saying um, I picked uh, B major for the start, but I'll include that flat, that, that flat fifth in there. It makes it sound a bit more interesting. And same thing with the uh, sus chord. If you play the sus chord plus the major, it just sounds a bit nicer. And instead of the um, A major, I add the sixth to it, which we're getting from the arpeggio, this, um, this F. Just makes the chords just sound a little bit fuller, a little bit richer, um, just to add a bit more interest really to the mix. Um, and then that's it. After that, what happens with the mix is it goes back to the start. We get the melody starting again with the same chord progression, but instead of starting on uh, B, we move up three semitones and the next section starts on uh, D major. And we go up from there. And then we go up three more semitones, and then three more, and then we're back to B again. And that's what happens with this, uh, with, with the original Sid, is it keeps going up and up on each loop until it gets as high as it can possibly go with the arrangement, and it, re it restarts back down to B again. And that's all there is to the song. It seems like quite a simple song. When you listen to it in the context of the game, it has this really nice haunting atmosphere, this unresolved atmosphere about it. Um, 
But uh, when you actually analyze it, break it down, there's quite a bit more going on under the covers. And when you rearrange it, you've got a lot more scope to make it sound a bit more interesting. Um, so with that in mind, what we do now, um, I'm going to take a quick break and I'll come back and we'll talk about some of the elements of the mix. Right, sorry about that. Uh, next door's kids came out into the back garden again and were shouting at each other. Um, it keeps happening. It's been happening all week. Uh, so I had to take a quick break. It's now quiet again, hopefully. Um, and uh, we're going to take a look at the mix. Uh, just before I do, uh, just a quick note about how I'm making this video. Um, I'm recording the audio separately through this great app called AUM. Um, so I can actually get the separate audio from Cubasis and from my microphone. AUM's a great app. Um, it's like a mixer but it supports audio and uh, effects plugins and MIDI plugins. Uh, you've got these MIDI routing options. You've got also all these uh, audio routing options, you mix buses, you can split and combine audio. I mean, people make music in this thing. Uh, it's brilliant, but I'm just using it today just to record the audio. Um, the only effect plugin I've got on here is this magic plugin called Brust Free, which is a uh, noise cancellation. Uh, you just train it with that learn button in the middle. And if I turn this off, well, it's quite quiet in here today. Anyway, it does completely get rid of any background noise. It's brilliant. If there's traffic outside, I've just had to close the windows. Um, it'll cut that out as well. Anyway, um, so so this is the mix. Um, there's a fair amount going on in here. Um, it's a bit misleading though at 71 tracks because um, several tracks, probably about 10 or 11 of them, maybe a few more, are frozen. Um, and Cubases have got this quirk, I guess it's a quirk, where when you freeze the audio, you see the little blue circle there. Uh, you get a separate track alongside it with the frozen audio. Um, and given how you know real estate on the iPad is uh, precious, uh, it's a bit annoying. I wish you could hide it, but you know you get used to it. Um, so let's have a look around, and see what we can find in here. Um, I think probably to start with, we talk about uh, some of the ambient noises at the beginning. Um, I added these later, actually. Um, once I'd figured out the arrangement and I'd figured out how the, the track was going to move from part to part, and I'd um, written out and actually performed all those parts, what I then tend to do with tracks is I go back and do a second pass and start adding in atmospheric, some people call it ear candy, other effects, just to kind of finish the track off. Uh, and that's what I did um, uh, so fairly late on in making this track, because um, initially at the start I just had the, uh, the the melody and the bass line and, and, and the beats. Um, so let's start with what I've got here. So first of all, I've got this um, uh, this great app called um, Frames. And for this play, what's being played here, it gets great atmosphere. Like it's kind of like a, a real long tail reverb in a tube station. It's hard to describe what this what this is, but it had this great atmosphere. Uh, I thought it was perfect for somebody wandering around in a big open space. Uh, it's just a granular synthesizer. There's loads and loads of cool sounds in here. Uh, and actually, just to make a, a a note about how I, you know, I don't really make my own sounds that often. I've got I've, I've collected so many synths over the last sort of two or three years since I've been making music again. Um, there's usually something somewhere that that that's usable that will be kind of what I've got in my head. Occasionally, I know what I want and I can kind of get there slowly. But generally, I'll just pick presets and tweak them from there. Um, so we've got this background ambience alongside that. I won't actually unfreeze this because although this is one of my favorites since ISEM, uh, it's quite buggy and uh, it forgets presets. So I'll be forever trying to find the preset I used here. Um, but what we've got here is just this background wailing noise, just a single note, which has just got an LFO on it that's just kind of wobbling it. And then for me, one of the most interesting sounds in here is uh, this here which I will try and get to play. Why is that not playing? There we go. If I just take the uh, insert effect off there, there we go. So this crazy sound called various insects, we can see why it's called that. And I tried to figure out how this was made. Um, still haven't quite figured it out yet how they managed to achieve this, but they, they seem to be sending um, the output of LFOs back into the mixer and mixing them up with the oscillators. So you see on the mixer, the oscillators are actually turned completely down. Oscillator one and oscillator two are completely silent on here. Um, so yeah, they're doing some sort of crazy trickery with the, with the mixer, but it's a cool sound. But in the mix, it was a little bit too present, um, a little bit full on. So what I ended up doing is um, sending it through this thing called Gate Lab. 
um, which I've got. That's why I wasn't playing. I've got, got to play the song. Wait for it to re-trigger. This is the annoying thing when you have these long running sounds. So it just chops uh, and changes the volume rhythmically. So it gives us this nice kind of stutter uh, that sort of kind of complemented the drums. And I've got a similar thing going on with the next sound, which is once again frames. I'll just unfreeze this. Um, it's called, um, I call it clattering, um, which we hear the sound. I love this name of it. What are you building? A quite an unusual sound. Yeah, what are they building? Uh, but what I ended up doing this uh, was uh, sending it through um, this other cool plugin I've got. In fact, let me just um, mute that, wait for it to re-trigger. So we open up this thing called Replicant and put that on. And it sort of rhythmically chops it up, does stutter, reverses things, adds various effects to the incoming audio. And it's almost completely random. So what I ended up having to do, because I loved the way this sounded, along with the drums and those uh, insect noises, was I actually ended up freezing this. There we go. Uh, and recording it, I think, about 10 times until I had the sort of randomness that I liked that fitted with the mix or had some most, the most interesting sounds. So we've got that in the mix. And then the drums, which an unfortunate thing happened with the drums. So this is a, a lesson in always save your presets. Um, so the drums are actually brilliant, brilliant analog drum machine called, um, uh, called Drum Computer by Sugarbytes. Um, and without going into too much detail on here, my sequences here, somehow between making this track and then making this video, I've lost half of my drum sequences. So it's a good job I actually froze this um, uh, at some point in the past, um, which is a real shame. But just a few notes about this was the song's in 3-4, but drum computers um, uh, uh, programming is actually uh, fixed at, well, designed for 4-4. Four, four. So trying to build a 3-4 beat on something where, uh, you know, you've got um, uh, bars that are ending halfway through this 4-4 four, four representation was quite a challenge. Um, but it's quite a lot of fun. Um, and also, the sounds you can get this thing this thing are, are fantastic they're really great i mean you've got complete control over uh, they've got different sections built for different types of um uh, of, of drum instrument uh, and it's just so much fun to play with uh, i need to use it more often um so that's the drums can't go into too much detail because unfortunately i lost um uh, lost uh, a lot of the um the, the sequences there nice we've got um, so we've got probably the, the, the least interesting part, I guess now, because we talked about it earlier, is the arpeggio. No, I didn't even bother using an arpeggiator, I just typed the notes in. Um, this is um, going through uh, a new synth I bought. Actually, this is one of those things, often when I make a new remix, I, it's usually off the back of buying a new synth that I really like. And this was, I think, I think maybe a few weeks uh, before I started making this remix, uh, FabFilter released a, a new version of Twin, Twin 3. Uh, it's fantastic. It's really good analogs, analog sounding synth. You can have four oscillators at once. And But the coolest thing about this is uh, you can define a separate a filter for each oscillator. And the filters are brilliant. Uh, there's all these different filter modes. Um, and it, it's a really deep, deep synth. Uh, I don't even profess to even understand half of it, um, but you can get some really cool sounds out of it. It's great for arpeggios actually, uh, because these uh, different controls you can actually do down here. You can draw in different waveforms. Um, it's brilliant, it's great. And I've used Twin 3 quite a lot throughout this track, because it was brand new. Um, so that's the arpeggio. I've also got, first time I've actually done this before, I've got a, a separate sub bass track. Uh, so I've got this synth called Agonizer. We can hear the sub bass in the background. It, Agonize is great. You can get some really deep, deep sub bass from here. And also, if you want, you could do some, dub, you know, some dubstep if you wanted to. Um, so yeah, that's the sub bass, separate sub bass track. And then all my other bass tracks, I've just ducked out some of the um, low end on the EQ uh, just to allow the sub bass to kind of live and breathe. It still conflicts with the bass drum a bit, which I tried to solve on a mastering. Um, 
But yeah, that's essentially it for the start of this track. We've got a bit of ambience, got this sub bass. Um, and then as we move on, uh, we've then got a couple of things happening. Well, first of all, just while we're up in the bass section, um, this bass is twin three again. And I don't know what it was. It, although twin three has, I think, slightly underwhelming presets, uh, it had this bass sound that was absolutely perfect for this track. I couldn't have wished for a better bass sound. It just integrated perfectly. All I had to do really was just tweak uh, the cutoff and uh, some of the ADSR to make it fit um, properly in the mix um, and get what I wanted out of it. But it was, it was pretty much, I've hardly changed this preset from the original. Um, so that's the bass. And then the other thing down here, I've kind of got this, this, uh, you know, this cool response thing going on with this thing I've called counter pad. Um, just, just at the beginning of the track, just to kind of add a bit of interest. So you've got this thing calling out to the bass and the bass response. Um, this is uh, an amazing synth uh, called uh, Terra Pro. Um, I'm not using any external effects, it's just the effects built in. But yeah, it's just a, it's just a fantastic sounding synth. There's some, so many great, great sounds in here. But anyway, that's what I'm using for that. Uh, opening, uh, opening synth. What else we got in here? Can't move the track on a bit further. Oh yeah, we got this um, retro synth sound here another another favorite synth of mine uh, called Xeon by Beep Street um, it's got this really nice uh, old analog sound um, but so we go back to the chords I was playing earlier on uh, and this is actually going through um, got a bit of EQ on here while we're doing oh yeah actually while I talk about this yeah one thing about EQing um, just pull out all of the low end on the instruments that don't need low end. Um, it's not a magic fix all, but it just it, it's just a simple trick that can just make your mix sound just that little bit less muddy. Um, I've read people saying that if you do this on every single instrument that doesn't need it, you can build up like a resonant peak around the actual cutoff point. Uh, but I tend to find uh, I avoid that by every time I need to cut the low end out of something. I don't reuse a preset. I just drag it randomly and just leave it there uh and i've never really run into that problem um so yeah the other thing i've got going through this is you can mark better here while you if you didn't know what the preset was like as i've actually got this uh, uh plugin that's a free plugin actually from uh, baby audio called pitch drift which gives it that wobbly vintage vhs sort of vibe uh, it really suits it because some of the chords just just adds that extra little bit of magic in the mix to it um so yeah, that's what we've got going with those chords there. Uh, then as the track goes on, what else we've got here? Oh yeah, we've got some arpeggios coming in. Uh, I kind of threw a lot of arpeggios at this. Um, for better or worse, right? this is something I do, uh, I'm quite guilty of, is I'll just throw everything at the mix. Uh, and will only stop when it starts sounding a little bit too crowded. Maybe I go a little bit over the top. Maybe in this, certainly towards the end of this track, it's a little bit too much. But yeah, you know, I keep doing it. It seems to work out for me. But yeah, I've just got this um, uh, Taluno LX, which is a, a Juno uh, Juno emulator, which sounds brilliant. It's got its you know like the, the old uh, Juno sixteen. All those they they have their own absolute unique character, um, and it's so cool to have this uh, available to me. I think there's a, it's free on on desktop. I think it is. Well, at least it's quite cheap. Anyway, it's a great sound synth. So I've just got the arpeggio going on there. A similar arpeggio here, which is, you see the two together work off each other. And this isn't by design. This is literally me just opening up a, a song that says it was from an arp section of the presets and just mashing the keys. And suddenly you have this thing that kind of sounds quite cool. So we've got that going on in the background. And then uh, we're, on to, we're on to the lead. The lead is from uh, Twin 3, which 
been used a lot in this in this uh, uh, th this remix. This lead, I loved it. Uh, it's got this thing where if I take the automation off, you can wrap this up. It's kind of got this uh, LFO square wave kind of octave thing going on. So yeah, I, I play around with that as the mix goes on. I sort of ramp that up uh, as, as the mix uh, continues on. Um, Forward. It's a shame I couldn't uh, show you the drum pants. I really love this bit, the drum uh, beat. All the sort of clapping hi-hats worked out quite well. Um, so as the mix goes on, as we reach this point, let's wait for it. Right, that was the point at which the SID repeats and then just goes up um, some uh, three semitones. And it was at this point uh, when I was um, trying to make this uh, this remix that I stopped and thought what am I going to do I mean if I if I then just take what I've written now and go up another three semitones um, and then do that again and try and add a little bit of variation everyone's just I'm going to get bored everyone's going to get bored um, so I remember what I did this next section where we had this big big build up and crescendo um, I it didn't immediately lead into that what I actually did was I, I went off uh, just went further into my track and started again um, and I tried to build up um, the, the sort of the next section of the song, but starting again from scratch. So I just started off. I, I kind of had this idea of a, you know, a, a sound in my head, one of the rare instances where I kind of knew roughly what I wanted. I wanted this kind of thin square wave scratching at your ear. So, uh, so I just built a basic patch, simple square wave, put a delay on it. And that worked out quite well. But then after that, what happened was um, something that happens a lot to me. I don't plan out my remixes from the start. I don't think oh, I want to get this remix that has this big crescendo and then does this little quiet bit. I don't. I don't tend to work that way. I tend to work fairly organically, and ideas often come to me because when I because of a sound. And so it all started off this section here, um, where oh, we just uh, okay. Once I'd actually had this going, it was a cascade of, of 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 sounds causing me to get a new idea. Then I picked a new sound, and it caused and it just built up over time. And so I had this heartbeat I put in, and these tracks are literally were built in order. I had this heartbeat, then I had this bass note. I thought oh, I've got this really really nice atmosphere going on here. Um, and it kind of reminded me of Ghouls and Ghosts. It had this sort of, I don't know what, what it was, maybe it's the heartbeat. And as a reference to that, earlier in the track, and I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of that in a minute. But yeah, as I went on, I originally had a piano in here. Um, now it's actually a synth, because I found this uh, preset uh, by a, a YouTube I follow uh, called The Sound Test Room. He put together a preset pack for Xeon. Um, it's like a piano, but it's kind of got a bit more noise and it's got a bit more atmosphere. I, I really like that. And yeah, and so this is just a cascade of, of, of sound inspiring a new idea, inspiring a new sound. And it just built up and built up and built up. Uh, and I ended up with this, this part of the song here. And I didn't know what to do with it. Um, but at least I had, I had a destination in mind. So I had this early first part of the track and I was thinking, well, I want to head to this point where suddenly it goes quiet. And that was the point at which I thought, let's build a big crescendo. Let's try and, you know, morph the track into like this big crescendo that can now land you into this pit of darkness. Um, one interesting thing on here, I think it's worth mentioning, was this, uh, this little arpeggio here. After I'd actually uh, uh, recorded it, I went back uh, when I was finishing the track off uh, and I put this delay on it uh, and it has this really cool effect so I set, the I set the delay time to be the same time as the arpeggio now if I pull up the mix on it you get this really disorientating kind of disorientating effect with the delay so yeah I'm, I'm end up I'm, if you listen to the listen to the song again you'll hear me pulling it up and down 
just adds this sort of air, air of sort of disorientation, which is what I wanted to try and achieve at this point in the song. Um, so that's largely it. And then, you know, this section then just led on to, um, you know, I had this simple, simplified version of the melody being played down here. Um, and here's, no, I didn't save a patch, did I? see always save your patches um, so yeah so a simplified melody and then that led on to an expanded melody and I had this idea in my head um, I can't quite remember where it came from but all these things come from a sound a sound inspires an idea um, and I remember thinking to myself um, just imagining you know ripping up I, I started I started ripping up paper um, so I recorded a few paper rips and then that developed into, um, you know, adding in some impact to it and then adding in some sort of extra rhythmic kind of working. I think I was probably inspired by that what are they building sound at the start. Maybe it was that, I don't know. Um, but, um, yeah, it very quickly evolved into I need this sound, I need that sound, I need that sound. And a lot of these sounds came from uh, free libraries I've just downloaded. There's loads of online um sample makers that give away free stuff all the time and i've just collected tons of them i've just got loads of samples littered all over my um uh, uh my internal storage um and yeah unfortunately a lot of the time it is a case of just going through just playing sample after sample after sample until you lose the will to live and then you eventually find something that you think that that's useful that gives you an idea and yeah it just ended up developing into this rhythm where i've got these you know um this sort of steam and I've got these cha these chains. It took me ages to try and find a, a chain sound effect. I want this sound of a heavy chain being pulled along the ground. And yet all this came together really fast because of one sound. Um, the sound of ripping paper. And I don't know how I got to this point. It's, it's um, you know, I, I, I don't know how it works. Uh, I don't know how my brain works. Um, the only thing I did try to do with this rhythm then is actually try and integrate you know, the, uh, the, the rhythm into the other things that are playing in the track so the ripping paper as soon as you finish ripping the paper it goes into the chord and just try and keep that rhythm together um, more arpeggios I like this arpeggio once again it's a preset in twin three so yeah to hold that notes on the keyboard um, and that seemed to fit and yeah I end up just tweaking the the filter on that as, the, as that track goes on there um, that lead sound I really really loved this lead sound um, it's uh, from a great sometimes buggy synth called Synthmaster sounds like, sounds like I've got a stuck note there um, really, really nice, expressive. Um, I bought the, um, <laughs> talking about being a preset surfer, they had the entire um, preset library for um, Synthmaster on sale on iPad about a year and a half ago for something like about £24. It's, it's a ridiculous amount of money when it's a full price. So it's one of those things I had to snap it up. And I must admit, Synthmaster is one of those things I go to all the time. Every time I'm stuck and I need something, there's always something in here that will kind of satisfy what I'm looking for or sometimes will just inspire me. Um, the only downside is the interface for um, Synthmaster 2. Uh, the routing options and the interface are just so hard, so hard to work with. So when you find a sound you love, but you wish you could change one thing, it can take an age to try and get to try and change it. And often you'll change it and just completely mess up the thing you liked about it, the uh, the sound in the first place. So um, anyway, Synthpath 2 is a great synth. There's some fantastic sounds. Um, uh, it's a uh, wavetable. It's got tons of waves, you know, absolutely tons of waves. You know, you could, you could spend, if you're a sound designer, you could spend so much time in here. I don't have time for sound design. I wish I did. Uh, barely got enough time to make music. Um, so yeah, that's that lead sound. And I think um, 
that pretty much covers that part of the track. I just want to briefly talk about the, uh, the big crescendo bit. Uh, and before I just, just delve into that, because it's basically, I'm just throwing everything I've had in the mix so far, um, uh, everything I've built so far at the mix, including a bunch of arpeggios and some choirs. But remember I said about that section, um, the quiet section reminded me of Ghouls and Ghosts. Well, there's a little uh, nod to that in here. Um, this thing here, just like that. It's a little bug in Cubasis where sometimes it doesn't actually solo the track. There's a little nod to Ghouls and Ghosts there. Um, oh, while I'm here, this is just one of those things where um, I try really hard to try and manage my transitions from one section of song to the other. Um, so if I just uh, just solo all the stuff that's going on in here, uh, often what I'll do is record something with a bit of reverb on it, reverse it, add reverb to it, record that again, and then you've got this this section of audio that you can flip back and forth and you can create these nice kind of sort of uh, uh, walls of sound that just build up and then just disappear with a bit of a reverb on them. It, it sounds quite cool. Um, so I just sort of that. This is, this is helping manage that transition for the loud part to the quiet part. So I've got that thud. What I ended up also doing was recording in, oh, there's my impact right there. Um, which is once again from an impact library. Uh, but one thing I also did is I recorded um, a, a choir uh, with kind of some a really odd chord, really sort of slightly discordant chord, uh, and I added a ton of reverb to it. Uh, and then I recorded it and I recorded the reverb tail. So you, what you end up getting from here is, we can hear it starting here. That sort of comes out of nowhere, but when you play it in the context of, 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 of the, the transition. It really helps take you into this different space in the, in, in the mix, in the track. Um, I think the only other thing that I haven't covered in here, uh, pretty standard stuff, I guess, really, in this bit where basically we, we build up. I'm just throwing everything at the mix. So I've got a choir here, um, which is, you know, pretty standard choir. This is using Korg Module Pro. It's from the Orchestral Dreams pack. They've got some quite nice pack, um, choirs in here. What I have done to help it poke through the mix, apart from adding some reverb on there to get some width on there, um, I've EQ'd out some of the real top end. Cause I, I'll talk about this in a minute. I had an issue with the real top end. Um, I'd end up solving it when, in, in the mastering stage. But yeah, once again, pulling out the bottom end on this choir. Um, I've got it running through this brilliant um, saturated distortion plug from Fab, Fab Filter uh, called Saturn. Um, you can add subtle uh, saturation or tube or tape effects to it. Um, it's also multi-band. I haven't used it here, but it's great because you can, you can saturate specific parts of the frequency spectrum which is brilliant for processing bases uh you know adding a bit more of a, a um, make a bass poke through the mix a bit more in the right way um it's great it's absolutely fantastic and i just use it often very for little subtle effects like you can barely hear it's here look at like actually it's a bit of an unfair comparison because actually it's, it's also uh, making it louder but yeah it's quite a subtle tube effect on here, but it just adds a little bit of extra saturation to help the choir poke through the mix. Um, I've also got, to go completely over the top, uh, a Selena string uh, emulation. And so all of those choirs, all of these arpeggios, which I've got going at the same time, like I say, I did throw everything at the mix in this song, uh, for better or worse. Um, but all these arpeggios playing at the same time. So that, along with the choir, and the chords, and the Selena string, and also the lead. Also, interesting enough, actually looking at the lead, um, I felt this lead was a little bit too... Um, didn't quite have enough body in this section. 
it was fine early on, but when things are getting really busy, what I ended up having to do was to kind of give it a bit more body by adding in um, a, a, a lead that had a, just a bit more body to it. So I've just got this kind of, uh, uh, you know, brass playing at the same time. And it just fattens the sound out a little bit more so it doesn't get lost in the mix when everything gets really loud. The only other thing I also did on here was when it gets really loud to try and help the other instruments kind of poke through uh, is, you know, I've got this bass line. i just actually put it back to this bit here. I've got this extra bass to help it, the top end poke through the mix. I've got, obviously got a sub bass, but I also got this uh, FM bass to have that impact so it kind of has a bit more punch. So we'll back up as well. And that, I think, essentially is it. I think I've covered most of it. Um, obviously, at the end of the track, it, you know, it's essentially a, a repeat of this crescendo, um, but I've just got a, kind of a different bass line going on. Um, I've got the same instruments. Um, the only other thing I do differently, I guess, at the end is right at the end of the track, I find a chord that resolves the entire song. Can't even remember what I looked or what I used, but I, I, I should look into that. Um, and then right at the end of the song, a bit, a bit of a cliche, I guess, really. But um, you know, this song is all about escaping. So there's the hatch door, and then slam it shut, and you get the birds. So they've escaped outside. Yeah, a bit of a cliche, but. You know, it just it was a way I wanted to finish the song off. Um, although there was an element to the fact that I left that chord playing for a lot longer than it needed to. So it just I just found it quite funny. So like, is this song ever going to end? Once again, I've got that Alina string there um, with Baby Audio's pitch drift on there as well. Um, so I think that's essentially it. Um, I hope that was interesting to look at the mix. Um, as I say, a lot of elements in here, lots of little tiny things. Um, and just before I finish, I just want to talk about one extra thing. Um, and that is mastering. Uh, what do I know about mastering? <laughs> I don't I hardly know anything. Um, it's, uh, literally just try some plugins until you get a good result. Um, so if I go to the master, what I do is I record down um, the uh, the entire track and I just load it up as a separate project and uh, apply some plugins to try and make it sound better. Um, yeah, and I guess what I've learned is, yeah, your mix has got to sound good, right? So you can't, mastering isn't this magical process that suddenly makes your mix sound awesome. Uh, your mix has got to sound good before you do any mastering. Mastering is all the little tiny uh little tiny bits of polish um uh, on top of your track um uh, i'm still experimenting with things some of this stuff in here i'm just putting on because i happen to have a plug-in it's got some presets i chose a preset and it sounded okay um so some of this stuff isn't very deliberate um but um i'm gonna have to probably turn this down because it's oh, i already have turned it down that's good uh, um future tim is going to thank previous tim there um yeah if I start off and turn everything off, let's run through what we've got on here. So first of all, um, you know what? I'm really going to uh, hate myself for doing this. I'm going to set up a new um, loop point. Um, but if I... First thing I do is uh, add a bit of stereo width. So this plug in here... Once again, very subtle, but I'm just pulling out the width uh, on uh, the, the high end and, and some of the mids. If you don't try and pull out the uh, the stereo width on, on the low end, that just sound a bit weird. You want your bass to be all in the center. Uh, but this is just that little subtle process just to widen that track just that a little bit further. So that's that. So very subtle, make really subtle moves. That seems to be the, 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 the what I've learned anyway. Uh, next up is um, a plugin I don't really understand that well, um, but I always try and gently squeeze my track, my tracks with a compressor uh, uh, when mastering, just to kind of glue the track together. Um, 
I've moved on. I tend to use different plugins nowadays, um, but I occasionally will try um, FabFilters Pro MB, which is a multi-band um, uh, compressor, just to see how it sounds. I'll just run through the presets, and if I find something that kind of appeals to me, I might use it. So in this case, it, it's not an easy comparison to make because there's a bit of subtle EQing going on in here as well. So yeah, really subtle. By doing this, when you get really familiar with the piece of music, you hear certain things that just a casual listener may not li hear unless they, you know, listen to the song again and again and again. And I found by using this, it kind of tightened up the bass a bit uh, and it allowed the top end to breathe a little bit more. Um, just some of the elements came out in the mix a little bit further. Uh, that's what you get with compression um, sometimes. Um, so I've got this multiband compression on there. This plugin, uh, I... I, I just bought it on, on sale. Uh, I don't use it um, in this track. It just happens to be still sat around. Um, this is probably the most interesting one and may be the hardest to, to show off. But with that on, if you listen to the bass drum, and it probably might be easier back at the start, if you listen to the sub bass and the bass drum, they're kind of fighting each other a little bit. I'll turn it on. There's a, I could hear this kind of resonant peak kind of going on somewhere down there. Uh, so I ended up finding it and it's more apparent in cer certain parts of the track. I don't know where but it was more apparent to me, but it is somewhere in this track. So what I end up putting on here is you'll see it dipping down. This is a, a dynamic EQ, uh, which is, uh, the best thing about uh, Pro uh, Pro Q3 um, is that if you've got something in your mix that's getting a little bit too loud, but you don't want to completely cut it out, you can put this dynamic filter on there, um, which acts a little bit like a compressor for um, that particular part of the frequency spectrum. And so you can kind of tame elements of uh, of your mix uh, without completely kind of destroying, you know, getting rid of them. Uh, and if you use it subtly, you can kind of tame resonant peaks really well without destroying the overall sound. Um, so that's what I end up doing here. That's something I probably should have fixed in the mix with uh, um, a side chain, probably. Um, but you know, at this point, I think I was I was done on the track, and I just wanted to kind of get it out. Um, and then lastly, what everyone else puts on their mixes that everyone moans about uh, is uh, <laughs> ow ow, that's too loud. Um, yeah, um, let's put a limiter on there and whack it up. Um, I I try not to do it. I try not to overdo it. Some people do. Some people go way too crazy with this. Um, let me turn it down. Um, I tend to get to, I try to aim for about minus 10 luffs. Um, try not to go much louder. Um, streaming services, I think, one about minus 14, I think it is. But I've seen some people on RKO, and they're like pushing like minus six, minus five. I, I've no idea how they get these things so loud. Um, it's quite. Um, uh, if you, when, you, when you're reaching for the volume control, when you um, switch from one song to the next, it's always, uh, uh, yeah, a bit frustrating. But yeah, uh, that's it for the mastering. Uh, essentially, I widen the mix. I normally gently squeeze it with the compressor, fix some EQ problems, and then just whack up the loudness as much as I can possibly get away with without um, annoying everyone. Um, so yeah, that's the mastering stuff. Um, and I think I'll probably conclude this video. So um, if you made it all the way through to here, thanks for watching. Hope it was useful um, and maybe I'll make another one in the future. Bye.